People in Fukushima have been living with fear and inconvenience since the nuclear meltdown two years ago. They hear daily news about leaks of radioactive water at the crippled power plant, and many still can't go back to their homes. Community leaders say they've had it with nuclear plants. They're joining hands to demand the scrapping of all reactors in their prefecture, not just those that melted down. Leaders from four towns are working together. Two of those towns host the Fukushima Daiichi plant, which has six reactors. Four reactors there were crippled in the earthquake and tsunami. The other towns host the Fukushima Daini plant. That plant has four reactors. None was seriously damaged. Officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company have yet to say what they'll do with the six reactors that are intact. Mayors and assembly chiefs from the host towns got together to demand company officials scrap all ten reactors. Some say they can think of no alternative, but residents have been forced to live as evacuees since the meltdown. The leaders plan to get assembly members to endorse their demand. Then they'll take that demand to government officials in Tokyo and officials at Tokyo Electric. We will strive not only to get the reactors scrapped, but also to help end the crisis at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Fukushima Prefecture Governor Yuhei Sato and members of his prefectural assembly have repeatedly called for all the reactors to be scrapped. The chief of the utilities, Fukushima headquarters, said he wants to discuss the issue with the townspeople. These people are congenital liars. We know we must take the feelings of residents seriously. But he said company officials can't reach a conclusion right now because they need to weigh both local views and the nation's energy policy. But no one weeps for the mass, for its life is worth less than zero. Just another cold fact of life on this horrifying planet. People in Fukushima Prefecture have been closely monitoring radiation levels since the nuclear disaster two years ago. They are now able to access this information when they travel on a public transport. Buses in four cities began using special equipment on Thursday to measure radioactivity from the nuclear accident. Researchers at the Japan Atomic Energy Agency developed this system. The real-time measurements are displayed near JR Fukushima station. The information is also available online. The data is updated every 30 seconds. Areas with low radiation levels are shown in blue. The color changes to green, then yellow as levels rise. The data can be tracked back to January. It's very useful to have real-time information about radiation levels because they change when we have windy or rainy weather. Japanese fishermen worry that leaks of radioactive water are threatening their livelihoods. They've lodged a protest with the operator of the nuclear plant. The chief of the National Federation of Fisheries Cooperatives voiced his frustrations in a meeting with TEPCO's president. TEPCO's efforts to manage the radioactive water are a shambles. I will see to it you spend the next 10 years in prison getting ass fucked. The leaks will have an immeasurable impact on the future of the whole fishing industry. We will take all necessary measures to avoid any further impact. It is just, these people are congenital liars. Pathological. And I guess it works for the gullible public. The fishermen had resumed some fishing off the coast of Fukushima, but the leaks have forced them to stop. Hirose said TEPCO plans to install more durable storage tanks at the plant. It's another bullshit experiment. The Japanese government is trying to assure farmers that the country's negotiators at the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Talks in Brunei acknowledge the sensitive nature of agricultural products. Government officials held a briefing for members of Japanese industry groups and other organizations on the process for the TPP talks. The officials told the participants that the three most difficult areas for negotiation are intellectual property, environment and competition between state enterprises and private sector firms. 
Members of agricultural groups asked the delegation to discuss tariff elimination for farm produce separately from that for industrial products. Government officials sought their understanding, saying that negotiators recognized the importance of the farm products involved.
Well, I wanted to ask about the latest news from Japan. Uh, Japan's nuclear regulator, uh, regulator said today it has officially raised the severity rating of the latest re radioactive water leak at the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant to level three on an international scale for radiological releases. The plant's operator, Tokyo Electro Electric Power Company, said last week that 330 tons of highly radioactive water leaked from a storage tank at the facility. Arnie Gunderson, can you talk about the significance of that? Um, I think that's just one of one of three problems that's facing the Fukushima site. Um, what uh, this particular incident was, was one tank that had um, a thousand tons of um, radioactive liquid water in it uh, when last they looked. And the next time they looked, there was uh, um, only 700 tons. And so 300 tons went missing. Um, the surveys of the area determined that the radiation coming from the ground was five times more in an hour than a normal person would get in a year. So we're talking about thousands of times more radioactive than the yearly exposure had leaked out of that tank. And that was the basis for um, the, the decision to call this a level three accident. One leaky tank out of a tank farm of, of 700. But there's been more tanks leaking on that site than this particular one. Um, this happens to be the single biggest and the um, highest radioactivity. But really, um, there's 700 tanks. There were some underground that were leaking. We have contaminated the underground water table with radioactive material from the tank farm, not just from this one tank, but from all the tanks that are, uh, that are on that site. And the problem's going to get worse. They're building about a tank every other day. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi's generating something on the order of 400 tons of radioactive water every day. A tank only holds about 1,000 tons. So essentially, two or three tanks a, a week have to be built to stay on top of this inflow of water. The other problem, the, the, the biggest problem, is that it's continuing. The, the radioactive uh, water is leaking out of this plant as fast as it's leaking in. So you've got something on the order of uh, 400 tons to maybe even as much as 1,000 tons of water a day leaking off of the mountains around Fukushima into the basement of this plant. Well, the basement's highly radioactive because the containment has failed and radioactive material is leaking out from the nuclear core into the other buildings. That's being exposed to this clean groundwater and making it extraordinarily radioactive. Arnie Gunderson, we want, to, we want to thank you very much for being with us, a uh, former nuclear industry executive who's coordinated projects in numerous nuclear plants around the country, uh, now an executive um, at Fairwinds Associates. And we thank you so much for being with us. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. One of the country's oldest and most controversial nuclear plants has announced it will close late next year. On Tuesday, the nuclear plant operator, Entergy, said it plans to decommission the Vermont Yankee nuclear power station in Vernon, Vermont. The site has been the target of protests for decades and has had a series of radioactive tritium leaks. In 2010, the Vermont Senate voted against a measure that would have authorized a state board to grant Vermont Yankee a permit to operate for an additional 20 years. Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin welcomed news of Vermont Yankee's decision to close. This is Governor Shumlin speaking to Vermont Public Radio on Tuesday. They're not economically viable. You know, I spoke with both Bill Moore, who's the president of Energy Nuclear, and the new CEO, Leo Denault of, of Energy Louisiana. And, you know, they've made the right decision. They've made the right decision for Vermont. They've made the right decision for Entergy. And what I said to them in those conversations was that, you know, we've obviously had very strong disagreements in the past about the future of the plant. But our job now is to work together together. Uh, with energy, uh, with the other governors that are impacted by this. And I also spoke this morning with Governor Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire and with Governor Deval Patrick of Massachusetts. Let's remember that of the 650 hardworking employees 
uh, in Vernon, uh, roughly 35% live in the state of Vermont, and the rest uh, live in either Mass. Most of them live in either New Hampshire or, or Massachusetts. And we're going to all pledge to work together uh, to get our rapid response teams into the plant immediately. Entergy's invited us to do that from all three states and find a a good economic future for the hardworking employees. That's who my heart goes out to, and I know the rest of Vermonters join me. The Vermont Yankee plant has been the site of scores of anti-nuclear protests since its opening in 1972. The closure leaves the United States with 99 operating reactors. For more, we go to Arnie Gunderson, former nuclear industry executive, who's coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country. He provides independent testimony on nuclear and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and officials in the U.S. abroad. He's chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates. It's Arnie Gunderson. Welcome to Democracy Now! This is a tremendous victory. Well, for the governor himself, who actually as a state legislator was opposed to the nuclear plant in his own district, as well as the thousands of people who have been protesting this nuclear power plant. Can you talk about the significance, how this was finally shut down? You know, it, it certainly is a victory for the legislature in Vermont. Um, you remember that vote back in, in 2010 was 26 to 4. It was pretty darn near unanimous to shut the plant down. Now, it took three years, but it was citizen pressure that got the, uh, the, the state Senate uh, to such a position. So uh, my hat's off to the citizens of Vermont for, um, uh, for applying pressure to the legislature for years that culminated in this uh, 26 to 4 vote. They... Um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back is, uh, is economics. Uh, you know, five nuclear plants have been shut down this year. Uh, we came into the year with 104, and now we're at 99, and the year isn't even over yet. Um, these, um, these small, single-unit nuclear plants, especially the ones that are like Fukushima Daiichi, are, um, are prone to more um, closures in the future because it just makes no economic sense to run a, a, an aging nuclear plant, this one was 43 years old, um, and to invest hundreds of millions of dollars more uh, to meet the modifications related to Fukushima Daiichi. So you think that the closure of uh, Vermont Yankee might lead to subsequent closures of the, the 99 remaining plants? Well, there's a paper out by Dr. Mark Cooper at the uh, uh, Vermont Law School, uh, and he predicts that as many as 30 nuclear plants are on the cusp of shutting down because of economic considerations. You know, a nuclear plant has um, 650 employees, as Governor Shumlin said, but the, uh, the real uh, comparison is against a comparable plant. A comparable plant of a, of a fossil plant would have 100 people. So the, the, the cost to keep a nuclear plant running is extraordinarily high. Um, the nuclear fuel is, is not as expensive as coal or gas, but in comparison, all the other costs are extraordinarily high. So there's a lot of downward pressure on plants like uh, Pilgrim, plants like um, uh, Hope Creek and um, um, the, the, those in New Jersey, that uh, Oyster Creek that was hit by Sandy just six months ago. There's a lot of cost pressures that, uh, that likely will shut down, uh, you know, another dozen nuclear plants before, um, before this all shakes out. Arnie Gunderson, um, before we move on to Japan, um, I wanted to ask you about not, this not only being a victory for the people who've been opposed to nuclear power in Vermont, but a real defeat for Entergy and what it tried to do, how it tried to circumvent the people's will, the Vermont legislature. Can you explain what it was doing and why the court uh, was so significant in this? Well, after um, the legislature voted to um, uh, not to grant a license to continue until um, after 2012, Entergy had promised to um, reapply for a license to continue for the next 20 years. Um, the legislature in that 26 to 4 vote um, said, no, we're not going to allow you to reapply. It, it's over. You know, a deal's a deal. We had a 40-year deal. Well, Entergy went to uh, first the federal court here in Vermont and, um, and won, um, and then went to an appeals court in uh, New York City and won again on the, right, on, on the issue, as they framed it, 
that states have no authority to regulate safety. The, um, and, and they successfully argued that. But the position of the state was never about safety. You know, I was involved in the uh, evaluations back in 2009 and, and, and 2010. And uh, uh, when we found safety problems on the panel that I was on, we immediately notified the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Our goal was to look at the, the cost of, of Vermont Yankee and the reliability of Vermont Yankee as an aging plant. That got muddled up in the legal arguments and energy prevailed. But um, uh, I think by closing the plant, you know, ultimately Vermont prevailed anyway. It's likely that that won't get appealed to the Supreme Court because when energy pulled the plug, the, the entire legal process has been mooted.